in this domain, we're going to be looking at physical security. Physical security is considered to be the first line of defense. Physical security is how we secure our facilities against physical damages and threats. We'll be looking at things such as electrical issues. We require good, clean electricity to the facility. And if something as basic as this, start to address the protection of property. But always, human safety comes first. These days, if we haven't implemented proper physical security, we are already negligent. And in the case of any sort of injury or accident, we will probably be found liable. What this says is we need to get the physical security plan, program, and awareness training in place as quickly as possible because, again, if it's not there already, we are already negligent and probably liable for any mishaps. We need to pull together a team which generally should represent each major faction or department in the organization because they know where their physical security threats are most prevalent. They know what they need to protect and I need their information to pull together the overall cohesive plan to help protect the entire organization. Now our mainframes, of course, got smaller, uh, more efficient, uh, they could do more uh, different types of batch jobs, but at that time it was really interesting because that was a glass house. We called it a glass house where the mainframe was. There's only a handful of guys who actually understood how the mainframe worked, interacted with it, and actually when anything went wrong, they didn't just do a configuration like we do today. They went into the code 
and uh, modified it there. Now the mainframe, what, at that place, we all took our batch files uh, to the mainframe for whatever job we had to have uh, taken place. And then we figured out that a processing needed to come closer to the actual users. So we moved a lot of the processing power from the mainframes down to the user uh, desktops. Now, why do you think information security is so important today compared to five, seven, ten years ago? Well, seven to ten years ago, we worked in this mainframe environment. Only a handful of people could interact with the system itself. So at that time, who knew what TCP IP was? Who knew what the OSI model was? What an API was? At that time, the knowledge about technology was very small, so there wasn't as many people who could do damage. Now, as our culture has um, grown, we personally actually depend upon more technology than we realize. Uh, healthcare, uh, the energy that we use, and, and businesses can't run without technology. We actually take technology as for granted. It's always there and it provides us a lot of functionality. Now anything that you really depend upon is a weakness. And so that's where the attackers have come in. The hackers came in and they knew that that was a weakness. Now in the beginning, hacking was just a lot of fun. There was just some uh, teenage guys who had too much time in their hands and it was very challenging. Uh, to learn about the different protocols and to be able to carry out, you know, uh, bring down different websites or affect something. But now that's actually changed. There's actually, hacking has changed from uh, some kids who are interested into it, in it to a much more um, organized crime. And that's what we're going to get into, identity theft and the types of crimes that are taking place. But the reason that security is so important is because we're so dependent upon it. It protects our money. It protects our data. And as the technology came from the mainframe down to the employees' uh, desktops, now they can interact with it, which means that they can make mistakes. So there's a lot of reasons that uh, security is important. It's going to be around for a long time. And now, you, it's not just general security information you, you need to know. People actually have to specialize, just like doctors have to specialize, maybe into web services, uh, application security. So this is not going to go away. It's only going to increase because the complexity of our environment is going to increase. So if you look at our environments today, talk about complex. We have networks, we have routers, we have firewalls. But then we're growing outside these bounds. We have wireless. We have uh, road warriors that have to communicate with the corporate uh, environment and the assets. We're setting up things like web services, which allow uh, different companies to use each other's services um, in open standards. We have cell phones that are basically computers. And our, the software itself is increasing in the complexity because we want more and more functionality. So our environment is going to only get more complex in the devices that we put on it and the software. Now, why does that have anything to do with security? Well, security and complexity do not get along. The more complex something is, the harder it is to secure it. Like in Windows 2000, there's 40 million lines of code. And that was Windows 2000. How do you secure that much uh, code? So in our environments, not only do we have devices like routers and switches, we have software that works on them, we have operating systems, we have applications, we have users, and now we don't even have a closed environment. We're interacting with other companies, with the internet, with uh, partners. So it's, our environment is becoming much more porous and the complexity of it is going to increase. And so if you're in security, you're always gonna have a job. Now, in this domain, it's information security and risk management. They used to call it security practices or security management practices. And we're going to go over kind of what they call the soft skills, development of policies, development of a risk management program, uh, development of, of standards, and we're going to get into uh, what security governance actually means and how to do a structure with that. We'll talk about the type of training and the type of awareness that needs to be in place. 
So in this domain, it's more of what a lot of people call the soft skills uh, instead because it's not overly technical. But this is where a lot of companies actually are moving into. A lot of companies have their head down in technology. And because of all the regulations, and now because security is a business issue, it's, these things are much more important or get a lot more attention uh, than they did in the past. So there's actually a gap in the industry of people who really know how to do these things compared to um, configuring a firewall or, or configuring uh, a, a KDC or something like that. So this is important. You may think it's intuitive and you understand it, but when you actually have to put it in practice, a lot of people have a hard time because it's a new thing. The goals of a phys physical security program should include these five major topics. Our first objective is to deter the attacker, convince them not to attack. If they do attack, the second goal says delay them, slow them down. The longer it takes them to implement their attack, the more likely they'll change their minds or the more likely they'll be detected and will be able to respond. So goal one is deter them, convince them not to do this. Second, if they do do it, cause them some delay, as much delay as possible. The third goal is detection. If they are going to attack, I'll slow them down so that I can increase the likelihood of detection. Now, if once I detect, I will then, goal number four, assess the situation. And step five is to respond. So deter, delay, detect, assess, and then respond. These are the five primary goals of the physical security program. The physical security program should have metrics established so that I can qualify exactly how well the security program is performing. I should have a before and after set of statistics on things such as the number of successful crimes or disruptions, the number of unsuccessful crimes or disruptions, things along these lines. So look through this list and understand that these are the types of metrics that we can implement so that we can qualify how successful our security program is. So again, taking a look at the big picture, we'll pull together a team from the major factions of the organization because they know where the threats are in their particular areas. We'll perform a risk analysis to identify where the vulnerabilities are and what the business impact of each of these threats on those uh, valuable information assets are. We will then begin to identify the acceptable risk level. Now this is done jointly with senior management. This is not that the objective or the, the responsibility of the security team. Senior management will always identify the acceptable risk level. We'll simply identify to them where we see risks and then we'll implement or we'll propose countermeasures that will reduce that risk to hopefully a level management will find acceptable. We then will identify baselines, in, in other words, the minimum level of security. A breach of this baseline triggers an incident and an, an investigation. So these baselines say this is what we expect as a, a minimum level of security for our organization. And then finally, we build the metrics so that we can measure the effectiveness of our physical security program. To summarize, the goals of the physical security program are to deter the attack, delay the attack, detect the attack, assess the attack, and then respond to the attack. We should implement countermeasures for each of these areas so that we can increase our physical security for the facility. We perform risk analysis to help bring the risk to an acceptable level. Remember, acceptable level of risk is defined by senior management. We simply tell them or advise them where we think we can get it if we implement the appropriate countermeasures. This identifies then a physical security baseline so that we can identify what exactly is an incident, what is an infraction of our physical security. And from there we will implement countermeasures to maintain that security baseline. To implement physical security deterrence types of countermeasures, we'll use fences, warning signs, security guards, and guard dogs. These are deterrents because the attacker sees these 
physical security components, these countermeasures that we have in place, and they are deterred from actually ever initiating the attack. The goal of a deterrent is to stop the attack before it starts. So the four areas where you can improve the deterrence relative to physical security are to increase the effort required to commit the crime. This means make it more difficult for the bad guy to actually violate the physical security of your organization. Increase the risk associated with the crime. In other words, make sure the guy understands he's probably going to get caught. We would do this with uh, uh, surveillance and um, a well-trained well -trained, uh, security guard staff, things along these lines. We would also then reduce the rewards of the crime. In other words, convince the bad guy there are no juicy targets here. There's nothing great for you to steal here, so just leave us alone. And finally, remove the excuses. If a guy says, well, gee, I didn't know I wasn't allowed to go in there, this is because you didn't have signs up that says, warning, uh, private property, uh, trespassers will be prosecuted. So these are four branches of deterrence that you can implement to help reduce the likelihood that a crime will occur. The second part of this is delay. Delay the attack. We delay the attack with implementation of locks and fences and layered physical security. This is an example of another approach to delaying attacks. It's, I'll, I'll leave it at this. So these layers should all work together. They should be tiered, uh, they should be integrated. Usually though they require a security guard to actually perform the response to this uh, delay approach. The point of delaying the attack is so that we can increase the likelihood of detection, assessment, and then reaction. And the reaction of course is usually uh, some form of security guard or police response. We have physical security delay mechanisms, and then we have administrative types of delay mechanisms. And again, we use these in combination, as you see in this slide. All these combinations, these factors working together to improve the physical security of our facilities. The third step is detection. First I deter, then I delay, and if they still are coming, I need to be able to detect them. So we need to be concerned about detecting physical penetration from outside to the inside and also what happens if the bad guy is already inside. So I need these intrusion detection systems both externally and internally. The next step is assessment. Once I identify that a physical threat is actually taking place right now, I need to identify exactly what the nature of this threat is and then trigger a response. The response could be the contacting of police or fire or medical personnel. The response could be uh, let the guard dogs loose. The response could be uh, grab a fire extinguisher and go put out the fire. We don't always need to elevate to the highest possible level and this is the conditioned response that the security guard can implement. Any one of these areas, deter, detect, assess, respond, any one of these areas that are weak can allow the attack to succeed. All it takes is one weak link in the chain. This again addresses the need for a layered security approach. And this is a, an example of all the different factions and layers that we might implement as countermeasures to help protect the physical security of our facility. Again, an example of the layered approach, the various areas where we need to implement security and the various countermeasures we might implement regarding those uh, security uh, objectives. In this next section, we're going to look at these topics. The first one is crime prevention, and more specifically, it's crime prevention through the use of environmental design. Next, we're going to look at facility construction, entrance protection, and then perimeter security. Let's take a quick look at the different types of threats that we might have to deal with natural environmental types of threats. These are storms, earthquakes, things along these lines, uh, uh, ice storms, etc. So these are natural types of threats. If our supply system gets shut down, whether that's uh, delivery of, 
of our raw materials, whether that is uh, failure on our electrical systems, even things such as uh, gas to heat the facility. These types of uh, supply system failures can actually disrupt your facility. We have man-made threats. This would be vandalism, this would, could be theft, this could be um, uh, disgruntled employees. So these are another form of threat. And finally, we have political types of threats, such as riot and civil disobedience. We need to implement physical security countermeasures to protect against all of these types of threats. Again, let's take a look at this crime prevention through environmental design. This is the physical construction of our environment that tends to deter a crime from taking place. If we have good lighting, good visibility, it is less likely that a criminal will actually take action. The whole point of this is to understand this relationship between the way a criminal will behave relative to their specific physical environment. Again, they want to be stealthy. If it's well lit, high visibility, likely that they'll be seen, it's very likely they will not commit the crime. Here are some examples of how we might design an environment to minimize crime. First we see on the left that there might be the casual bypasser that could observe a crime taking place. The area is well lit, so the more public the place, the more visible the environment, the more well lit the environment, the less likely a crime will be committed here. With this in mind, here are some examples of how we might design our, our environment to implement this crime prevention through environmental design. Keep the hedges and shrubbery low enough that a bad guy can't hide behind them. If there are people in the area, a criminal is less likely to commit the crime because of so many witnesses around and they might even stop him from committing the crime. Good visibility, good lines of sight, and again this requires good illumination uh, and even boundaries. We see this, uh, the term lights and bollards down below. Bollards are boundaries that are placed along walkways to identify public areas and private areas. If we have physical access control, such as the double door here, a criminal now realizes this is going to slow him down. This is a delay tactic. This is going to slow him down as he makes his escape. So the, the criminal is less likely to commit the crime in an area designed like this. Natural surveillance. Create wide open spaces as you're building your facilities or as you're designing your facilities. Again, this increases visibility and it makes it less likely that a criminal will feel comfortable uh, in committing his crime. It's more likely he'll be detected. Territorial reinforcement, again, bollards, fences, uh, boundaries. What we want to do is present visible boundaries uh, that identify where public turf is and where private turf is so that the bad guys will know when they're violating uh, the private territory. Here's a great example of that concept. Another aspect of this is target hardening. In other words, make it difficult for the bad guy to get to the area of uh, uh, intended crime where the theft might be taking place or the crime might be taking place. Make it difficult for him to get there. Again, this is a delay tactic. Uh, this also is a deterrent. If they see large fences, if they see uh, large locks, things along these lines. If there's signage that says, uh, warning, this premises is, uh, uses a, an alarm system, you will delay or deter the attack. So we want to harden the targets and make those, that hardening visible to the attacker. Now, natural boundaries such as rivers, cliffs, hills, things along these lines uh, also tend to impede an attacker. If he doesn't have many ways to escape, he will feel less confident and may decide not to attack this particular area. Next, we're going to look at facility site selection and facility construction. Regarding site selection, you'll want to consider this list of uh, uh, potential issues. Uh, is the area prone to natural disasters such as flood, hurricane, tornado, or earthquake? If you're going to look for inexpensive property, you might find yourself in a 
high crime area. We need to consider this as well. This might mean you'll, while you'll save money on, on rent or property costs, you'll spend more money on securing and protecting that facility. Do you need access to trains, airports, and highways? So we'll need physical access to the property. Uh, are you the type of business that, wa that requires walk-by traffic from customers or pass-by traffic? Or do you want to be isolated and hidden from the public? Are you in a strip mall where you might have uh, problems with your tenants, the joint tenants, people uh, adjacent to your property? How close are you to emergency services? And do you want a high visibility business or low visibility? If you require customers, if your business is the, the type that, that caters to customers, you might need drive-by traffic and walk-by traffic. You want high visibility with bright neon signs. However, if you don't require that type of business, that's not where your revenue stream comes from, you might want to keep a very low profile and actually fade into the shrubbery. This uh, latter concept is called urban camouflage. You don't want to be visible, you want to be just another uninteresting building in a huge city of buildings. Nothing attractive, nothing interesting, nothing appealing. Next we'll look at construction of facilities. You need to consider what is the building going to be used for. Are we going to be making bubble gum and candy bars or are we making military weapons and things along these lines. You recognize the construction requirements for those two very different types of businesses require different types of construction. I, am I concerned about emanations security? Emanations of course are electronic impulses that can be detected from outside the building. So I might want to construct the building that reduces emanations leakage from the facility. If you live at if you live in an area where the facility is located near earthquakes or fault lines, you might need to consider this in the design of your facility. Fire resistance is always an issue regarding the construction, the design and construction of a facility. Light timbers burn in approximately 30 minutes, whereas heavy timbers will, will not burn for up to an hour. So you want to consider these types of things. By the way, local fire code may have some de definition on what the requirements are in your local areas. Light frame is cheap and easy to construct, goes together quickly, but will burn and collapse much more rapidly. Heavy timbers are substantially more resistant to fire and will support greater weight, small that a person could not come into or go out of that window. And if we have many doors and sometimes these are required for uh, fire requirements uh, due to the uh, local fire ordinances I'll see to it that I have controlled entry one or two controlled entryways and if I need more doorways for emergency exits they will be locked from the outside and will have alarmed crash bars on the inside so that they open easily from the inside so someone can escape but will know about it immediately and can react this is an example of the types of things you'll consider as you're designing your data center.
So here we see several examples of the types of closed circuit TVs that you might be interested in positioning around your facilities. We have external types and internal types, and then we have the multiplexing and recording gear as well as monitoring equipment. Next, we'll look at intrusion detection systems and ways to secure mobile devices. Intrusion detection systems come in basically two forms. We have the electromechanical type that are cheap and fairly reliable, and we also have volumetric types that are a little more expensive and provide just a little bit more false positives than the electromechanical. The electromechanical types are magnetic switches, things like the metal foil that we put on windows, and when somebody breaks the window, it breaks the, the conductive foil and triggers the alarm. And then we also will look at pressure sensitive mats that detect when someone enters a room. The volumetric type use generally uh, either radio frequency or acoustic energy to identify motion, usually through Doppler effect. There's also the infrared type, the photoelectric type, that detects changes in heat patterns that would identify a human walking through a cool room. So intrusion detection devices can be expensive, but will only trigger an alarm. The alarm doesn't stop the bad guy from doing bad things. It requires human intervention. And here again, we, we see the need for the security guard. These intrusion detection systems generally should have redundant power supplies. If a bad guy can knock out the electricity to your building, then your intrusion detection systems and your alarms are now defeated. So they need redundant power supplies, battery backup, things along these lines. Again, they need to feed to a central security system where we have guards monitoring or we notify the police or the fire department. They should have a fail-safe configuration. In other words, if these detection devices do fail, that they don't lock in humans that might cause injury uh, to the human beings. They should be resistant to tampering and we should recognize that this is only one component in the many, many layers of security required to implement a true physical security system. One form of the electromechanical sensor is the pressure sensitive mat that, that detects uh, someone entering a room or a facility. We had discussed these a little bit when we were looking at the man trap. In the man trap, they're a little bit more than just a pressure, pressure sensitive mat. That was uh, also specifically identifying the weight of the individual, actually a biometric measurement. Another electromechanical sensor, again, relatively inexpensive and easy to implement, is the contact sensor. This says that if a window is open, the contact is broken and the alarm goes off, or if a door is open, things along these lines. Relatively easy to install, relatively inexpensive, and fairly secure as far as the uh, false positives, fairly accurate regarding the, uh, the false positives. Other types are the closed circuit, again, uh, very much like what, we've see, what we saw earlier. These are switches that detect when a door is open, a window is open, something along these lines. So the closed circuit uh, says turn off the alarm when the circuit is closed. If the circuit gets broken, sound the alarm. Now volumetric sensors are another form of intrusion detection system. These generally are either radio frequency, acoustic, or thermal, infrared, to identify motion inside the field of monitoring. So the radio frequency type emit a radio frequency wave. That wave reflects off of objects within the field of coverage. If there's that might be on site or report to the police department or fire department, etc. And then, of course, there's the proprietary alarm systems that can do all the above. Uh, generally, these are a little more expensive, a little more customized. One aspect of physical security that we need to address is securing of mobile devices. Laptops and other devices like this are stolen on a regular basis. And uh, one approach is to secure them physically, make them not mobile anymore. Uh, this is, as we see in the, in the diagram, the photograph here, we see a cable lock on a laptop. But that means now that the portability that we paid for is no longer a feature. So we always have to consider the truly portable device. These days there are products called LoJack and other sort of phone home types of technologies that can help to trace this device if it does get lost or stolen. What how these operate is whenever the device 
connects to the internet, the device reports to a server. If the laptop is lost or stolen, the owner reports it stolen to the company that provided this software. And when the device actually connects to the internet again and phones home and connects to the server, it reports its location based on IP address. Now, unfortunately, that's as good as it gets. Now, the IP addresses do have a general geographic location associated with it, but this certainly isn't uh, an address on a street where I can go knock on the door and say, hey, I'd like my laptop back. So this tracing software, this uh, low jack or, or phone home type of technology isn't necessarily a guarantee you're going to get your device back. Always with mobile devices, we want to encrypt 100% of the data that lives on the hard drives, and we also want to have strong authentication. If we can implement it, multi-factor authentication should be a requirement on all these devices, as well as strong encryption for all data that is maintained on these devices. Here we see a list, a small list, of laptops that have been lost or stolen, and the records, the number of private records that have been violated or compromised as a result of these, uh, these portable devices going missing. Next, we're going to look at support systems for the facilities, things that we have to protect against uh, uh, violation as well, because if a bad guy can knock down my air conditioning in South Florida, I have to close my facility. My workers will refuse to work in, in these high temperatures and uh, so I have to protect these as well. We'll look at electrical power issues and then finally we'll look at fire prevention, detection and suppression. Some areas of consideration regarding fire prevention are the building construction and the wiring of the facility, the safety procedures we might implement regarding fire safety, training of employees, and we'll be looking at uh, practice drills so that uh, employees are well trained and know what to do, and then also some housekeeping issues so that we eliminate the types of components in our facility that could cause the fire. It should all start with a strong security policy that says what acceptable use and unacceptable use is. There are four components or four legs of a fire. Four components of every fire are heat, fuel, oxygen, and a chemical reaction. The suppressants we use to put out the fire will affect one or more of these four legs of the fire. You should know all four of them. Our fire prevention measures will either reduce the temperature, remove the fuel, 
disrupt the chemical reaction, or remove the oxygen from the source of the fire. The sources of fires are all over, and you should, during your physical inspection of the facilities, recognize and identify these fire sources so that you have proper countermeasures in place. With fire detection, there are generally four types of fire detectors. You need to know all four of these. The first, and probably the most prevalent, is the ionization detector. An ion is a positive or negative, negatively charged particle or atom. Atoms by default have a balance of protons in the nucleus and electrons orbiting around the protons. So these are not ions, these are balanced atoms. However, in the presence of high temperature and chemical reactions, we tend to cook off or attract additional electrons, causing an imbalance in the charge. The imbalance in this charge on an atom is called an ion. Again, in the area of a fire, ions increase. And so we detect these imbalanced atoms and are, use this as our detection mechanism. These are relatively inexpensive and probably the most prevalent uh, fire detector. The next type of fire detector is a thermal detector. There are two types of thermal detectors. The first one is a fixed temperature thermal detector. This device says if the temperature ever exceeds, for example, 125 degrees, sound the alarm. That's a fixed value. The other type of thermal detector is called the rate of rise temperature sensor. It, this device says that if the temperature rises more than 10 degrees in a one minute period, sound the alarm. So again, two types of these thermal detections, fixed or rate of rise temperature sensors. The next one is called the photoelectric smoke detector. What this guy has is a light source that hits a photo detector. And when the smoke in the room fills to a point where it breaks that light beam, it sounds the alarm. And the fourth and final is the infrared detector. Now the infrared detector also uses a photoelectric cell to, to identify light, but it's not, uh, it doesn't provide its own light source. The light source that the infrared flame detector is looking for is the actual fire itself, the heat from the fire itself. You should know all four of these types of fire detectors. Where should we place fire detectors? Approximately everywhere. They should be in the drop-down ceilings, they should be in raised floors, they should be in the ventilation systems, and they should be where we have people. Looking at fire suppression agents, we have gases, we have chemicals, and we have liquids. You'll need to understand the difference between these. Halon was a very popular fire suppressant. The problem with halon is it depletes the ozone. So the Montreal Protocol declares that halon should no longer be used as a fire suppressant. There are a whole family of halon replacements, one of them being FM200, another one is CO2. Carbon, uh, carbon dioxide unfortunately has the downside of killing people. So while it effectively puts out the fire, it can be detrimental to the people in the environment. Dry chemicals are not effective against electrical fires. Dry chemicals are generally used on liquid fires. Water is a good suppressant for uh, um, your standard types of fires, not based on liquids being ignited or metals being ignited but your standard combustibles. So water is a very popular suppressant for your standard combustibles. A soda acid is a, an effective suppressant for oil types of fires. This table shows the five classes of fires. You should know this table by heart when you go to take the CISSP exam. The first class of fire is called the Class A fire. The type of combustible is all common combustible, such as wood, paper, cloth, and plastics. Again, as I indicated, water is one of the more prevalent suppressants for the Class A type of fire. Soda acid is used if the fire is based on perhaps cooking oil or something along those lines. Soda acid is very often used for this. Soda acid can also be used in the fire ex extinguishers. A Class B fire is a liquid fire. These are flammable liquids such as petroleum, tars, oil, solvents, alcohol, and very often 
The most popular suppressant for these are gases. We see CO2 and FM200 both being suppressants for the class B type of fire. Again, these are both gases. One of them, of course, CO2 is hazardous to humans, and FM200 is an approved halon replacement. You wouldn't want to put liquid on a liquid fire because you'll cause the fire to flow to other areas and you'll ignite other types of combustibles. The third type of fire is the Class C fire. This is an electrical fire. With electrical fire, the first thing we want to do is shut down the power to the, to the area of ignition. The second thing I want to do is put a gas on this as a suppressant. So again, I'll use either a uh, halon, a halon replacement, or I'll use CO2 if I can uh, use the CO2 in the area. Again, remember, CO2 is hazardous to humans. The fourth type of fire is a class D. The class D is combustible metals. Now, the problem with combustible metals is they burn at very high temperatures. If you put water on a metal fire, what you'll find is in, what you'll get is in a steam explosion and you'll cause more damage than the fire alone. The best way to put out a Class D fire is with dry chemicals. These would be the powders. These tend to be fairly exotic and specialized. The good news is we don't generally have combustible metals in the home and in, in most of our companies. We don't have to deal with these materials, so we don't need to be too worried about the exotic suppressants required to put them out but you should know that a Class D fire is a combustible metal and it requires dry chemicals to put it out. And finally, the fifth is called the Class K. This is a kitchen fire, and this is a combination of the common combustibles along with a, a cooking oil fire. And uh, so we can use water on the common combustibles, and on the cooking oil we would use the soda acid to put this out. Earlier, I indicated the need for emergency power shutoff switches and that our security personnel should be trained that it is their responsibility to throw this switch in case of emergency and also be trained on where and how to turn off this power in the emergency situation. We have a special need in addition to that in the data center. Of course the data center is heavily reliant on power. There's generally a great deal of electricity in the area to power all the devices and so generally we'll want an emergency power sure that our plan is updated and is current because the facility changes. We add a new wing or we remove an area of the building. Uh, so all these should be reviewed and tested at least once a year. In addition to fire detection suppressants and prevention, we also should have water detectors to identify water damage in case of a broken pipe or a sprinkler system uh, that, that fails. So these can also help to minimize the amount of damage in case of some sort of water leakage. They should be placed under raised floors, placed in the drop-down ceilings. Uh, again, very similar to smoke detectors, where do you place these? Approximately everywhere. All these things we've considered need to be put together in a cohesive plan so that they operate in a synergistic manner.
Okay, so now we went through the physical security domain. And although this domain isn't as large as some of the other domains, it's very critical. It's critical for organizations and companies, especially after 9-11 and a lot of the terrorist activities that's taken place. Uh, and it's critical on the exam. It's getting hit more and more because it's more important within the society. So although it's a smaller domain, it's very important that you spend a lot of time and understand the concepts uh, that we've walked through so far. Now, we talked about the um, facility location, meaning where are you going to put your location based upon um, the surrounding environments. Uh, we talked about construction materials, which is the type of material you're going to use to build your facility based on the threats that you have. So we went through the different types of timber and um, how long, what their hour um, burn rate is. We talked about uh, if you need to use actual uh, concrete. And the goal is to uh, understand your threats, your enemies, and how much they'll go through uh, to actually hurt your facility. Thus, you need to um, build your effect if something bad's going on. Assessment means we need to know how to carry out an assessment um, after there's, um, let's say that you know, a place has been robbed. Well, what, what steps do we go through? Uh, who do we call? Uh, what, what about collection of evidence? So we need all of that laid out before it actually happens so we do it in a standardized method. And the last piece of the program is response, which means uh, we have to be planned for uh, being able to respond to different uh, situations. We need to be able to respond um, for emergency situations if people are hurt, uh, somebody needs to know CPR, we need to have a first aid kit, uh, we need to have our contact numbers for the um, fire department, the police station. All of that needs to be put in place, documented, um, so that it can be carried out in it when it's a very chaotic environment. We talked about electrical issues and the problems that can cause if, if there's disruption in the electrical the power that's coming into the environment and the type of um, things that would cause problems. And then we also went through the countermeasures that should be put in place. We talked about perimeter protection, which would be the fences, the security guards. Uh, we went through different types of doors because your exterior doors are different than your interior doors and the type of doors that you use uh, depends upon your threat level. Um, we talked about different types of windows. There's different types of windows that need to be used uh, in different places throughout. Through uh, fire protection, you need to know the classes of the fires, the countermeasures that um, are used to suppress the fires, all the, the best practices, and um, that halon isn't being used anymore. Uh, the best replacement for halon is FM200. Uh, we, we went through different types of um, the wet, we went through different types of like uh, water sprinklers that, that are used for fire suppression and that would be wet pipe, dry pipe, pre-action, deluge. So these are some of the critical things that you definitely need to be aware of. Um, and again, I can't stress enough that a lot of people will read through this and think that, oh, they understand it or, or most of us are actually geeks. Most of us come more from the you know, technology side of things. And physical security doesn't really come into our realm of thinking. So some people kind of don't spend enough time with this domain um, and then really get hit on it when they take the exam. So I've told you, now you know. It's up to you to, to, you to do the necessary studying and do a good job.